And we're delighted that you could join us for what I think will be an incredibly important discussion on an issue that unfortunately does not get as much attention as we'd like to see in Washington, and that is the upcoming November summit to be held in Vilnius on the Eastern Partnership countries. Now, as I'm reminded, in just a little over three weeks, uh, Lithuania, the government of Lithuania, will take over the rotating presidency of the EU Council. With it comes an, imp an impressive agenda, uh, but its focus and one of its highlights will be the Eastern Partnership Summit. Now, thankfully for this conversation, I fear we have taken some of the foreign policy brain trust out of Vilnius, and it has arrived here in Washington to be with us. Uh, we are delighted to welcome Benedictas Jurka, chairman of the Committee of Foreign Affairs of the Lithuanian Parliament, um, and he's been elected to Parliament since November of 2012. Previously, Professor Jurka worked as rector of Vilnius University from 2002 to 2012, and previously was the prorector for research at Vilnius University, and has held very prestigious positions as the president of the Lithuanian Academy of Sciences from 1992 to 2003. And he is joined very ably by the deputy chairman and former foreign minister of Lithuania, Odronius Ajubalas, uh, known to so many in this room. So almost difficult to uh, introduce, but uh, we are delighted, uh, Minister, that you are here. Uh, he has served as Minister of Foreign Affairs of Lithuania between 2010 and 2012, and uh, was a very visible presence during the Lithuanian chairman in office of the OSCE in 2011, um, and uh, has held senior positions uh, as a delegate to the NATO Parliamentary Assembly and to other very prestigious positions. After the chairman and the deputy chairman are done giving their reflections on the Eastern Partnership Summit and the Lithuanian Presidency, we turn to our good friend Steve Nix uh, at the Inter International Republican Institute. Uh, Steve directs as the Regional Director for Eurasia. He is truly one of Washington's uh, foremost experts on, on Eurasia, Ukraine, Belarus, Georgia, the Kyrgyz Republic, uh, Russia and Ukraine, where he uh, focuses IRI's activities. And many times we call upon Steve to just give us some reflections on what's going on in the region. So after uh, Steve concludes, then we will open the floor for your comments and discussions. We are delighted to welcome uh, many uh, excellencies, Ambassadors Montano. We're delighted that you're here, Ambassador Kadrarai. Thank you so much. And we have uh, with us, as I said, I think we've, we're emptying out the Baltics and the Parliament. We have the Chairman of the Estonian Foreign Affairs uh, Committee with us as well. So thank you all for being with us. And I, to start, I, I, as I was reflecting on this, morning, uh, this afternoon's conversation, I thought five years from now, after we hold the Eastern Partnership Summit, will historians think that we got it right or that we didn't get it right? So with that reflection, Mr. Chairman, over to you. Thank you. As former professor, usually uh, I'm you teaching. Want to stand? Uh, oh, good, good. Thank you. Mrs. Chairperson, uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, it's a great pleasure and honor for us, together with my colleague, to, to be here in Washington. Just uh, thank you very much for a so nice introduction. But, uh, you know, you forgot to tell that I'm professor not in political sciences. So I'm professor of biochemistry. So you can imagine if you will decide to, to, to raise some complicated questions, please address to, to former minister of foreign <laughs> affairs. Tough questions go there, easy questions there. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, probably you know that this year, uh, for Lithuania especially, uh, because just after two weeks, Lithuania will begin to cheer to European e Union Council. Uh, of course, it's a great challenge, big challenge for Lithuania. Uh, Lithuania will cheer for the first time. Uh, probably you know that each country in the European Union, uh, we, which is taking the presidency of European Union Council, among other problems, uh, 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 other things, 
have to choose some concrete priorities. So uh, Lithuania government and our parliament was chosen four priorities, uh, energy security, you could imagine for Lithuania is very important priority, but not only for Lithuania, this Baltic Sea uh, region strategy, borders protection, board, and uh, today we try to talk about the, one of the priorities which Lithuania choose, this Eastern Partnership. Ladies and gentlemen, of course, you know that this European project uh, was founded, started uh, exactly four months ago, four years ago in 2009. So Eastern Partnership Project is a European project, is very important, and what the, what the purpose of this, this uh, project, European Union, uh, is thinking that's very important. You know very well, Eastern partners, there are six actually European countries, Ukraine, Moldova, Belarusia, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. Totally, if you will take it, it it's around 70 million population. So geographically, it's really all these six Eastern partner countries are European countries. And of course, European Union would like to, to have these European countries closer to European Union by values and other things. Of course, it's not so easy to, to imagine that all these six Eastern European partners very soon will become members of European Union. But the idea to bring closer is, is very clear and it's very important because you know very well that we have some neighbors uh, in Europe which are planning to create new union, Euro-Asian Union. You know very well that Russia, Kazakhstan, and Belarus, they are planning to establish, I'm thinking, as alternative union to European unions, Euro-Asian Union. Of course, it's difficult to imagine this new European Asian Union to be very strong without, for example, Ukraine. So it's a very important moment, I think, today to make as much as possible to bring closer really these six countries, especially Ukraine, closer to the European Union. I would like to, to remind and to mention that uh, one of the top meetings during our presidency, it will be Eastern Partnership Summit at the end of November. Lithuania as a country, politicians are dreaming that during this Eastern Partnership Summit, European Union would sign association agreement with Ukraine. It would be, it would be top. It, be, it would be great accent for our presidency. The question, what's the problem? The first logical question, do Ukraine itself really wants to join European Union. Theoretically, it seems yes. Even sociological investigations show that it was strange for me that about 60% of people in Ukraine would like to see themselves in European Union. Some people we are talking, okay, it's, it's not, not the, the case because when you take eastern part of Ukraine, it's, it's not the case. But even in eastern part of Ukraine, is, so people are thinking that it's a good idea to, to go to European Union direction. So the people would like to join European Union, it seems. But what the politicians, very recently, I think, about two months ago, President Yanukovych visited Lithuania, and we had possibility to meet him in parliament. Probably you know better than me that 
political decision also was very clear, and this political decision to join the European Union is fixed in special law. So people would like to join the European Union, even special law, so it's political decision. So what, what, what are the problems? Why, why not to join? Why not to sign association agreement between the European Union and Ukraine in this Eastern Partnership Summit in Vilnius? Of course, Lithuania, we politicians from position and opposition, we were traveling a lot to Brussels, to Berlin, to listen what are thinking about that European politicians. We met even European Union, for example, President, Mr. Rampey. We met three vice presidents of European Parliament. We met very distinguished politicians from Germany. And I was a little bit surprised that they are thinking that Ukraine is okay, is not ready today for the signing the agreement between the European and Ukraine. But I ask to these politicians, including President Rampey, is it possible to make some compromise? If everybody understands that if not European Union, it could be Euro-Asian Union. So we need, I think, in European Union to think about compromises. We understand everybody. It's not everything OK in, in Ukraine. When we are talking about rule of law, about democracy, about corruption, is it's OK. These it's really, these are serious problems. But are, I was asking, not so less problems have, for example, Serbia, Western Balkans. Why we are doing some compromises for them? I, I think it would be nice to make some compromises. Because association agreement just is the first fast step after that, it's a lot, very big distance between signing the association agreement and becoming a real member of the European Union. We will have many, many years maybe to educate it, to influence, to become more democratic country. So my idea is that we have to keep very seriously this problem because in any case we will have new imperia euro asian imperia which will be extremely strong if ukraine will join this new structure so i was asked to to talk about five minutes, but just I will very shortly to talk about Belarus. This is country which is among these six Eastern partner countries. But Belarus is among these three Russia, Kazakhstan, and Belarus, Russia, which are trying to create alternative. So it seems that Belarus, theoretically, one leg close to European Union, the another leg close to Euro-Asian Union. How long it's possible to, to keep two legs in very with big distance with that? So it's a real problem because Belarus is very far from democratic country. And today we are not talking uh, about Belarus as a real member of European Union. 
So very much closer is Armenia, Moldova, and Georgia. They are doing quite good exercises, and I think uh, these countries are a real potential members in the future, members of European Union. So ladies and gentlemen, I will stop and thank you for your attention. I, I should, uh, in some ways, uh, uh, should do the same like, like, like my colleague, because here on, uh, on uh, Eastern Partnership, we have bipartisan agreement. And we do not have differences, and we do not see differences in our tactic even. But I would like to say a few words uh, about United States att attention to this part of the world. I think that this engagement, which we see now, at least I am see, it's a very dangerous thing. And it broke United States tradition to be engaged in Europe. United States invested a lot in Europe. United States invested a lot in East Europe, and it paid off. Visegrad countries, Baltic countries now are free, democratic countries, comparatively well-off countries, members of NATO, and EU. And I would say partly it's because of United States engagement, because of your active policy. And now we reached the second stage in our region. We have Eastern Partnership, and we have six countries. We are so different. Uh, but if we want to get those people, if we want to have uh, Europe, as it was once said, whole and free, we should fight for these countries and for these people. And sometimes even we should make some even small compromises. We do have values. Another side has no. And sometimes values could, could be very good for autocratic regime. Because speculating the values, you could, you could kick out the countries from I would say pro-European pro -European, uh, circle. And I think that you will be much more stronger in Ukraine, Georgia, Belarus, and Moldova if it's back vocally, visibly, and with very power instruments from the United States. And here, I would like to uh, say, praise, I would say, some American NGOs who works very actively in this part of the world. And here we do have Stephen Nix from IRI. This is a very effective organization which works in the heart of Eastern Partnership countries. We have an office in Lithuania. The same I could say about NDI. The same I could say about NET, Freedom House. They are much more active than the United States administration itself. And I would like to see that the highest United States leaders, starting from president, vice president, Senate, and House leaders would back the Eastern Partnership process, because it's a vitally important, not just for our region, not just for Europe, but it's also in the 
long run for United States of America. Thank you. Steve, would you podium as well? Thank you. I should say for the record, lawyers also like to stand because they're accustomed to it. So I feel more comfortable standing before you here today. First of all, thank you, Heather. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Chairman, uh, for putting this together and joining me today uh, for a very important topic. And I'd like to start uh, any discussion of this part of the world in Lithuania. I'd like to begin by first thanking the current government and previous governments of Lithuania for their assistance to IRI. The minister was very kind in terms of his, his remarks about IRI. Uh, really, uh, the thanks go to Lithuania. IRI has operated its Belarus program out of Vilnius, Lithuania for the past 10 years, for over 10 years. Uh, we are currently, with the closure of our Moscow office, running our Russia program out of Vilnius, Lithuania. Uh, this wouldn't be possible with the support and assistance of the current government and previous governments. So I start out by thanking Lithuanians for their friendship, for their support, and on behalf of our chairman, Senator McCain and IRI, uh, we want to thank you for really for everything that you've done to help us to try to be effective in the region. I don't know who said it first, a lot of people take credit for this remark, but one ambassador uh, said to me, you know, Vilnius, Lithuania is like a fighter that punches three weight classes above its weight. And in terms of democracy building, I think that's really the case because we're seeing uh, Lithuanians, NGOs, government entities active in democracy building, not just in the region, but in Asia and in Africa and in the Middle East. And we welcome this and we appreciate it. So thank you, gentlemen, and it's, a, it's an honor for me to join the two of you today. It's no wonder, given what we have said today about Lithuania's track record, that it not only chaired the OSCE under Chairman Azublis, but now is, will soon assume the role of the EU presidency. And that brings us to today's topic. Again, this is a long-held effort to bring a certain designated class of countries closer to the European Union. That's the stated goal. It's gone in fits and starts. I think everybody in this room will admit uh, some have progressed faster, more effectively than others. Uh, I'll start with Ukraine because that uh, seems to be uh, the recipient of most of the, of the attention regarding uh, the events in Vilnius. Uh, I would start out by saying as, as important as Ukraine is uh, in terms of the region and its future direction, I don't think that the ministerial in November should be judged a success or not based on whether there's an accession agreement signed. Certainly that would be great, that would be terrific for Ukraine, it would be terrific for the EU, but I don't think we can, uh, uh, we can merely judge it to be a success only on that basis. Uh, Moldova has made many strides. There will be an important discussion about Moldova, uh, and I'll, I'll get to Moldova in a minute, but, but first Ukraine. As the chairman pointed out, uh, Public opinion has been mixed in Ukraine. Uh, for a number of years, we've done polling in Ukraine and have asked that very question of respondents, should Ukraine be part of the European Union? And as the chairman stated, generally, overwhelmingly, 65, sometimes 70 percent stated that their country should be part of the European Union. However, once the customs union started to become a serious point of discussion, then we started asking the question a different way in our surveys, and that is, given a choice, would you like to see your country be part of the EU or the customs union? And there the results are somewhat different. And frankly, it's pretty much an even split, uh, 40 to 40 to 20, 20 percent being undecided. So with the advancement of this pro-act that, that we see from Moscow, there is a change in public opinion. And as you can guess, the respondents who uh, advocate admission into the customs union are largely from the East, the Donbass, the Russian-speaking era. But that remains a pivotal point. There's still some question uh, in the minds of Ukrainian voters about the direction of their country. I think what ultimately will decide 
uh, Ukraine's future is the presidential election, which is scheduled to take place in March 2015. And there the key is uh, unity. Uh, the numbers, the polling data suggest that if the opposition presents a united front, that is, they rally and support a single unified candidate, they have an opportunity to win this election. And if they're successful in doing so, several events will flow from that event. Yulia Tymoshenko will be freed from prison, and this particular country will move closer to Europe by virtue of its policies, its democratic development, its institutional development, it will naturally flow westward towards Europe. So there's a lot at stake at this election. And we'll have to see, as, as uh, many of you know who follow Ukraine, it's easy to say unity, but unity is that elusive quality in Ukrainian politics that, uh, that they are seeking. But the three main parties are working very well together, uh, working very closely on a number of uh, issues in parliament. So it remains to be seen as we get into 2014 if that unity can be maintained. Moldova. Again, I think that uh, it's fair to say that Moldova has been one of the bright lights in the region in terms of democratic development, in terms of, of gravitation towards Euro-Atlantic structures. And certainly Moldova should be an important part of the discussion in Vilnius. I think you all know the current state of affairs. There's been a new uh, government formed. It's a very fragile coalition. Uh, three votes would decide whether or not the coalition remains intact. Uh, because of this small margin, uh, we don't expect that the legislative or executive branches will uh, undergo major transformations, make big decisions in terms of policy between now and the summit. I think the likelihood is that the government will play it safe, knowing that regularly scheduled elections will take place next year. Uh, the question is, will that be good enough for continued advancement uh, within the European Union? I would suggest that it will be. And so I'm very positive in terms of the discussions on Moldova uh, in Vilnius. On Belarus, again, the chairman uh, noted the current situation. Whenever I explain Belarus to someone who's not fully acquainted with the set of facts there, uh, members of Congress, for example, uh, I always explain to them in this way. I remind them of their first election to Congress as, uh, as um, a challenger. And I say to them, imagining running for Congress for the first time, you're the opposition, you know, you're the, uh, the first time challenger, and in your campaign, you have no access to TV, no access to radio, no access to print media, uh, and no access to direct mail. And yet you're expected to get 50% plus one of the votes. That's the challenge that one faces in running for public office in Belarus. And then congressmen really seem to understand the, uh, the environment in which opposition parties work in Belarus. Uh, Again, I don't expect anything to change appreciably in Belarus between now and the Vilnius summit. Uh, what we're trying to help the opposition focus on is local elections, which come next on the electoral calendar there, uh, and to not discuss presidential elections. Uh, a lot of politicians are talking now in, in Minsk about having presidential primaries, a congress, or some other uh, mechanism to select a single unified candidate to face Lukashenko in the next presidential election. Uh, we don't think it's the time for that. We think the strategy should be for them to uh, compete, compete uh, in, in a very um, uh, ambitious way to try to get people elected, get people on the inside for the first time in local government in Belarus, and then set the stage, use those outposts of democracy in, in Rayon, Oblast, and city governments, and hopefully run a competitive campaign against Lukashenko, knowing that the playing field is not going to be level. Uh, just a couple of comments about Georgia. Uh, we're asked all the time about Georgia. It's difficult to predict a lot of things uh, politically there. Uh, obviously, uh, the new government is, is uh, trying to do its best. I think that the question of cohabitation is one that's widely discussed. I think will largely be solved uh, very easily uh, after the elections. After the presidential elections, I think a lot will become clear in terms of 
policy and governance uh, because the constitutional amendments adopted a year and a half ago will take legal effect. And as you all know, that centers power primarily within the offices of the Prime Minister and within Parliament. So then it becomes a question of, of how does the Georgia Dream Coalition Caucus in Parliament interact and work with the UNM deputies in Parliament. And I think that's, uh, that's where we ought to focus a lot of attention and assistance to help them work together to produce legislatively in, uh, in Georgia. And again, depending on who wins the presidential election, I think it largely solves the issue of cohabitation between the, the president and prime minister, uh, not just because um, of, of who might win the election, uh, but the fact that, again, the presidency will operate from a perspective of reduced, greatly reduced powers. Uh, so then that will give the prime minister the chance to move forward on policy. So again, in summary, in Georgia, I think the case is uh, a lot of things that we hope to see in Georgia are likely to take place after the constitutional amendments uh, take, take uh, legal effect, and that will be at about the time of the EU uh, uh, event in, uh, in Vilnius. That's a very, very brief summary of the countries, and then I understand we'll have the chance to discuss and take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thanks, many thanks to all three of our panelists. Uh, quite a tour de force. Uh, I, some of the key words that I picked up, compromise, U.S. engagement, values, uh, and I think these are important issues as, as we continue on our discussion. I'd like to take the moderator's prerogative and to use a baseball analogy, throw out the first pitch, but that's just to warm my other pitchers up here in the audience to get their questions uh, and, and comments ready. I'd just like to remind everyone this is an on-the-record uh, discussion. Um, Steve, you, you throw out a provocative thought that I'd like to tease out a little bit more. Is this summit a milestone? And um, as I was preparing the invitation and a colleague received it, he said, oh, you use the word roadmap. I hate the word roadmap. I said, why? And he goes, because it's always a road to nowhere. We never know uh, where, we're, uh, where we're going. And, and so what I'd like to, to hear from all three of you, you know, is this summit one of those turnkey moments where some decisions are going to have to be made, or is it simply another process issue, that it's, a, it's an opportunity to raise the issues and move forward? What's the worst thing outcome? What's the most positive outcome of the summit? And, and I ask this leading question because I, and I'm, as a Europe director, I want to understand more uh, Europe's policies. I really lost the clarity of thinking of Europe's vision for the Eastern Partnership Initiative. It was boldly started, Poland and Sweden, a lot of leadership, but as the European debt crisis has consumed Europe's energies, I can't quite find that articulated vision. So I'd welcome your thoughts on that. And, and ways, um, um, Mr. Minister, you talked about U.S. engagement. How does the U.S. engage with the summit? This is a European issue. We don't have a vote here. How does the U.S. engage? So if that doesn't keep you busy for the next 10 minutes, I can't help you. So, no, thank you. Uh, all right, Mr. Chairman, you can take the soft ones. I think you've deserved, right? The Mr. Will, Mr. Minister will okay, take the hard ones. Just uh, maybe very shortly. Sure. You know, this, when we are talking about this European project, Eastern Partnership, uh, the question is, what is the future of this, how to say, project? Idea, it's a it's very good idea to, to, to bring closer countries from Europe to, 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 to European, European Union values. So this is, but question is, I am thinking myself, so successful this Eastern Partnership Summit or not successful from what what their criteria? Success or not success? So one could say success if, for example, you, Ukraine will sign an association agreement with the European Union. It's really success, I think. But if it will not happen, so it will be success or not success. So I think it, it, it depends on the 
politicians from European Union, very distinguished politicians, who are thinking about the, the next step. So one group of politicians are talking, if it will be not signed this agreement, forget this European Union project. Mm -hmm. So Eastern Partnership project, actually it would be just in, in the, on the paper. So we are, this group of politicians are thinking that is, it will be stopped. But I think it, it's it, it not because it has to be continuation. So uh, we have to be optimists. So signing, not signing, you know, the, but this is project which we, we have to continue to work with these countries to prove uh, that uh, you have to, 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 to change your society. Everybody today understand in these countries that something wrong inside. And uh, from my point of view, no, we will sign this agreement. On my side, it's, it's not the end of, 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 the, of the life. It, it's, it's my opinion, and I think, but you know, I, I am very much surprised. Maybe I am wrong. I, okay, I am a new politician. But we, when we are talking with these distinguished person from Brazil, always they are talking about uh, Mrs. Timoshenko, you know, if we, Ukraine, Yanukovych will release Mrs. Timoshenko, okay, it, it's clear. We, European Union will sign this agreement. But from my point of view, is it possible that one person, from the one person, depends on the future of the country? I think it's, it's not right. If one person could regulate the future of, of 60 million population country, keeping in mind that from my point of view, Mrs. Tomoshenko is not angel. So it just, I think that uh, we will sign or not sign this project. I think it's a very important project. We have uh, to, to, to work further. Thank you. The Eastern Partnership policy is about the EU transformative power. Do we have this power or not? Could we serve EU as a good example uh, on, their, on, on the way uh, of uh, democratic reforms to this country's society? This is a question. And uh, uh, of course, I could uh, easily mention what we could expect uh, from this uh, summit. But, the, but, but, but we are not, I'm not talking about the summit itself. I'm talking about process. How we could keep this process alive? How much money EU gives? I mean, help, to helping, uh, um, I would say, to those countries to transform society. Even now, if we are talking, let's say, about the uh, next MMF, I mean, it's a multi-annual financial framework. It's a budget, seven years budget. We know that it's already agreed that one third of this budget part, which is, goes to the European neighborhood policy, goes to the east, and two thirds goes to the south. But now I would like to ask you what we are talking about. When I'm talking about these countries to the east, we, I'm talking about European countries, which are very important for us if we feel, if we want to build, the, as I said, uh, United Europe. And of course, it's very important, the, the countries from the North Africa. But in this case, I see them as the European neighbors. They also deserve our support. They also deserve our um, deep uh, look, uh, but at least I think that the, at least the financial resources should be uh, divided equally. Uh, now you ask about how, how does United States could engage, very simple. 
these countries need an attention. I would see that it would be very good if someone from United States administration would visit these countries. I couldn't remember the last visit of, of any United States president, let's say, to Ukraine. Maybe it was, uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's a very simple, uh, uh, it's a question. It means the visit shows your interest or shows your position. I would say so. If no visits, no position. The same with the money. I'm, I'm again talking about money. But the money to NGOs who operates, who works in this part of the world are essential because sometimes diplomat, diplomats couldn't do what the NGOs could do. That's my answer. That's a plan. Steve? First of all, I was trying to remember, I'm, I'm almost afraid to admit this, but I, I believe that the last U.S. president to visit Kiev was, uh, was Bill Clinton. I could be wrong, but... Uh, that's, a, that's a quest. George, George W. W. George Bush one. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, again, I, in terms of the ministerial and how it's judged, how it's perceived, uh, there are plenty of events that took take place at the ministerial that would dictate success, would connote success. Uh, and again, I don't think the succession treaty with Ukraine should be the definitive issue of success for the Vilnius summit. It's certainly an important factor and it's an important debate, and there are persuasive arguments on both sides, but again, that is the European Union's decision. Uh, I would say more, if you look in terms of this summit, you have to look to the founding language. And if you look at the statements made by Carl Bildt and by Radek Sikorsky, when this effort was first outlined and formalized, it was, as the minister said, about bringing these countries institutionally uh, and from a values perspective closer to Europe. And I would argue that several countries have done that and deserve some recognition at the summit. I've mentioned a few of them in my remarks, and I think that defines uh, what success is. And, and again, that is consistent with what the goals were set forth at the outset of this effort. Wonderful. All right, I see lots of hands. Ms. Uh, we have microphones here. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, why don't we, if it's okay with the panelists, why don't we take a few questions, and then we'll uh, have the right hand. And then Thank you very much. Uh, Igor Muntar, Ambassador of Moldova to the United States. Um, I have a couple of remarks to what uh, our friend Stefan Nix just stated. First of all, I just wanted to tell you that we are very much missing your programs in Moldova. Unlike the countries that have uh, requested you to leave their territories, we never did that. And we really appreciated uh, always your support to the political parties and to the political transformation of my country. And uh, in connection to the fragility of the government, I just wanted to tell you that uh, the new cabinet of ministers has been voted with 58 votes, which means almost 60% of the, of the uh, members of the parliament, and uh, one, 53 uh, signed personally the agreement of the coalition, which is a little bit uh, a different equation. The chemistry of the political coalitions, always coalitions are fragile. In our, uh, um, document of the coalition agreement is stated that no one, no party will leave the coalition until the next elections, which are scheduled for 2015, not for 2014, which means one and a half year. Uh, it's quite a long period uh, for, for the coalitions. Um, uh, Your Excellencies, you have uh, uh, provided and shown your support to Ukraine and uh, repeatedly your commitment are very strong. But um, tomorrow we are launching the, the last round of negotiations on DCFTA. And hopefully in a week or two, we end up all the, the elements uh, that are still missing. Ukraine started with two years before Moldova, the negotiations. Uh, is there a fantasy or is it a possibility to see Moldova and Ukraine in the same twin of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, promoting the idea of an association agreement? since uh, all technicalities are settled. The government is stable, is a pro-Europe coalition in place. And we 
and you and other, other friends have always encouraged Moldova to look forward, not to look backward. And this is not a, exactly that Moldova will stay outside of the borders, will be a kind of sanction or a penal, penalty to the political parties. It will be a penalty to the public, which in uh, our conditions is extremely important. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Bill Courtney. I'm a retired diplomat. Um, I imagine you would expect that if the European Union does sign an association agreement, there will be negative reactions from some quarters in the United States. Uh, a number of non-governmental organizations that have been strongly supportive of Lithuania will be critical. We have one million Ukrainian Americans in America. Many of them are disappointed with the Yanukovych presidency. They don't all regard Mrs. Timoshenko as an angel. Uh, but the issue is not just Mrs. Timoshenko. It's uh, heightened corruption, criminality, uh, a real threat to the future of democracy that's taken place under the Yanukovych uh, presidency. In the context of uh, a crackdown on human rights and political liberties in Russia, that is probably a greater threat than what we're seeing in Ukraine, Signing an association agreement with Ukraine would undermine the European Union's moral authority in dealing with the problems in Russia. And to the extent that Lithuania is seen in the leadership of this, it would undermine Lithuania's moral authority among many people who are supporters of Lithuania. Ambassador Steve Pfeiffer and Ambassador John Herbst, two former US ambassadors in Ukraine, have written eloquent op-eds offering ways to proceed. Why does the European Union want to risk its reputation signing a negotiation agreement when in fact the likelihood that Ukraine will go to the Eurasian Union is not very high? I am Yaroslav Bisuk, Deputy Chief of Mission of Ukraine to the United States. And I would like to begin, first of all, by thanking uh, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Minister for, and, and Lithuania for its support of uh, Ukraine's integration into the European Union. Um, this is the uh, most Im uh, important strategic priority of Ukraine. And it's supported by the Ukrainian population, by civil society, uh, all political parties, and um, the diaspora of Ukraine abroad, which might be critical of the government, but it doesn't question the Ukraine's course of becoming a part of Europe. Uh, we see this course as our ability to modernize and become a more democratic, uh, more strong economically uh, country and transition from post-Soviet to European state. And we see this agreement as, as a vehicle to achieve those changes, as a roadmap uh, for these transformations. Uh, we understand there's a lot of homework for us uh, that needs to be done. And uh, uh, we are doing it in, in good faith. You know, some things are uh, more difficult than others, but um, you know, we're determined to meet the benchmarks set by the European Union to sign this agreement in, in Vilnius. And uh, I believe it will be a win-win situation for both sides because it's not a gift to Ukraine. Ukraine will give its huge um, potential, both human, economic, uh, to the European Union. So uh, signing this agreement will be beneficial for both sides. And uh, like what was said, it it's not the end of the road, but it's a step that will uh, firmly set Ukraine on the tracks uh, towards European integration. So we appreciate the support and count uh, on continuing of this support. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have important questions on Moldova and it's uh, being in the same category with Ukraine for the summit. European Union's moral authority, and of course, again, the uh, this important strategic objective. Who would like to go first? All right. Thank you. Uh, about Moldova, of course, we support Moldova, and uh, I just want to apologize uh, that we are talking here more about Ukraine rather than about Moldova, but uh, it's because in Moldova, everything considerably after your government crisis now goes well. Yeah, no problem. Uh, now, there are a lot of problems, but, uh, but uh, I must say Less that, what, personally, what, what I could expect 
I could expect that during Vilnius summit, uh, it will be association agreement would be with Moldova initialed. This is, I think, it's a realistic yes. uh, approach. About uh, Ukraine, about undermined uh, EU and uh, Lithuanian moral authority, possibly if the association treatment agreement, uh, 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 association uh, uh, agreement would be signed, I, I don't think so. We perfectly know the achievements and shortcomings uh, in Ukrainian society, in state institutions. But to sign an association agreement doesn't mean to ratify it. And here, the EU will have a very strong tool. Even more, I would say that a few weeks ago, together with my uh, party chairman, Mr. Kubilus, former prime minister, we went to Kiev and we started, we had about 14 meetings but purely with opposition. We didn't have any meeting with the, with the uh, current uh, uh, government officials. And we tried to clarify their position regarding association agreement. Uh, because our position was that uh, the intentions, natural intentions of opposition to beat the position couldn't be a case in this time for Ukraine because so much at stake. And, you know, we were very happy that when we left Kiev, after one day, the three opposition leaders, main, from the main parties, signed the declaration regarding association agreement. It means that the unfortunate and undemocratic case uh, of Mrs. Timoshenko wouldn't be used as an opposition tool to beat current government, knowing that the ratification goes la later. That's why I think uh, uh, the EU, if the association agreement would be signed, the EU will not undermine its moral authority, as well as Lithuania. Uh, that's it. <laughs>
expressed maybe better than in Russia situation. But it's real problems. But, uh, but uh, uh, as, uh, as my colleague was talking, the association agreement is the, the, the first step. There are so many intermediate uh, steps which has to cross until become a, re a real member of the European Union. There's so many uh, possibilities to, 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 how to say, to educate, to consultate for them. And uh, I think, uh, um, of course, this is a, a selective justice. Is the, uh, people are talking on no, no democracy, selective justice. Uh, they are very happy that Lutsenko was released, so it's a good signal they are talking, maybe the first signal. And they, some of them, they are waiting the second signal, the releasing of Mrs. Timoshenko. But you know, from my point of view, as I mentioned, just like would repeat, it's impossible that the, the very nice politician, very nice lady, even a beautiful lady. Okay, maybe she is not uh, very guilty, but the future of the country, it's, you know, it's difficult to, to connect with the, with the, okay, with the one person. It's my private uh, opinion. It's but uh, I just, uh, uh, here, with your permission, I just want to say that, uh, let's take the Burma. It was a pressure, and it was some steps from Junta. And now we see some, some progress. We are talking in the same way now about Ukraine. Signing association agreement, and long, and very, I would say, uh, supervised uh, situation in, in, in Ukraine, and long process of ratification. Because you could sign 10 association agreements, but they will not be in power because of, you know, of, of the shortcomings in, 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 in yeah. this. Could, could I add uh, uh, just a <laughs> concrete example about what my colleague was talking? That just, I'm, we'll talk about Serbia. Lithuania is only one European Union country which doesn't ratify association agreement. Okay, stabilization or something. Okay, more or less the same. Okay, why Lithuania, only one country which n not crossed through the parliament? Because, so just uh, I would like to provide example how it's possible to, to how to say, to educate a little bit with politicians. Because some of our businessmen invested to Serbia For example, they paid 50 million euros, they built a new factory, and certainly after some time, this factory was nationalized. So the country which would like to join the European Union, could you imagine? State decided to, 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 to bring back the factory. So it is scandal. You know. This is international arbitrage now. We, 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 and it, they are asking now, Premier Minister from Serbia came, you know, please ratify, uh, ratify this agreement. We are talking, stop, okay. But so just as an example, there are many possibilities after that to control, to check w w what is happening in, in this country which is dreaming to join the European Union. So this is extra example of a Serbia. I just, real quickly, uh, thank you, Ambassador Montiano, for your remarks. And yes, it's true, IRI has been asked on more than one occasion to leave a country by the host government. Uh, we did not, but not in Moldova. Uh, you wanted us to stay, we wanted us to stay. It was an issue of uh, our funder. So uh, if USAID invites us to return to Moldova, I promise you, We'll be back to do governance type programs and other programs that will, that will help Moldova. But to the point, uh, what I was trying to convey was the fact that uh, I don't expect this new government, this new coalition is new. I don't expect drastic uh, events to take place legislatively yeah. prior to the summit. But I do think that Moldova continues. And as I said previously, free trade agreement with Moldova, 
uh, undoubtedly a huge success, and that would certainly qualify uh, to be a successful summit in Vilnius if things like that could, could happen prior to or during the course of the ministerial. So thanks for your remarks. Uh, Rosetta Vingovic, Joe Wilbur. I write for Lithuanian American Dealer Drogas. I have a couple of questions. First of all, I heard a lot you mentioning Eurasia, Eurasia. So, where's the limit? It's going to be European Union like Eurovision right now because then it's, we have uh, six countries and other six countries. So, where do we stop? So that's one of the questions. The other thing, uh, you mentioned the compromises, but on the other hand, the Serbian example shows that compromises are not always working. And I do agree with the retired diplomat who just mentioned that they think you're giving a prize before the race. So uh, I do agree. So I wanted to ask about, do you think the Serbian example is that compromises are not working? And is that really the position on Lithuania, or just you, that you are for Eurasia? Well, my name is Anantas. I'm, I'm just a student, let's say. Uh, I have also a couple of questions. Um, two of them directed to our guests from Lithuania, and one for Mr. Nix. So first one, um, we hear a lot about Eastern Partnership Initiative. However, in press, and in here, we ended up talking only about Ukraine. Okay, um, Belarus is a completely uh, interesting and separate case. It's more complicated just because of the uh, political situation in the country. But we have six countries in this Eastern Partnership uh, Initiative, and uh, somehow we are left a little bit aside. My question would be about, for example, Armenia. The association agreement with Armenia that would be very interesting in the terms that it has its own conflicts, especially with neighborhood countries. And that conflict involves Russia as well, which support one side, unfortunately not Armenia. So how this um, association agreement will impact EU relationship with Russia? Second question would be about Lithuanian presidency. Um, Lithuanian Lithuania uh, pointed out very four interesting, let's say, priorities. However, the presidency will be handled during the very interesting and tough times when we still have economic crisis and everybody is focusing about economic economy, basically. How Lithuania is really going to push up these questions to their priorities on the EU presidency list? And the second and the third question is to Mr. Nix. It's about Ukraine. <laughs> um, you mentioned very interesting word unity, and you said if opposition will be able to be united and will come up with a very strong candidate, it might succeed and it might change the course of the country. However, I used to work a lot with Belarus, Belarus and Ukraine um, in youth programs. And that was the only problem why all the time during all elections, opposition failed just because they couldn't find the disagreement who will be that one united strong candidate. So what do you do and what kind of strategies do you have to unite that opposition? How are you going to educate them to show their strength that being united in opposition, you can really succeed and win the election? Thank you. We address those, and then I'll bundle up a couple of more. Regarding Eurasia and uh, EU enlargement, I do not afraid any European nation which has a strength and desire to implement refor democratic reforms. That's for me the question about which country Maybe it's uh, on the edge of Asia or on the edge of Europe. For me, it's not a question. For me, it's a question about the real intentions of, of these countries' societies and political elite. Which way we are choosing, democratic path or autocratic? I do not afraid enlargement, because Lithuania, as well as Estonia, Latvia, and, and uh, Visegrad countries are best example that we could succeed. 
an enlargement. Uh, Serbia, I would like to say that the question is not about, about one, one other company. It's a question about the investment uh, climate in this country, which was, by the way, underlined in European Council conclusions. When the heads of, of European states came and discussed this question as well, and, it was, and it's underlined that the Serbia should take a lot of attention to, invest, to, to the in investment climate. It's not just about us, about our company. Of course, it, we care. But the question about, about the, as I said, about very substantial thing in, in general. The second, about, uh, uh, about Armenia. I think Armenia did a marvelous job to be very frank, I didn't uh, expect it. Because they really, they negotiated very well. They closed one chapter after another. And the same like Moldova, I would, I would expect that in Vilnius summit, the association agreement will be insured initially. Sorry for my pronunciation. Now about, about how Lithuania, uh, because of economic crisis, uh, will, will implement its priorities. It's not our priorities, actually. It's a European priorities, because the, yeah. the border security, EU border security, it's a common cause. The energy security, it's become a, one of the topic, maybe number one in European Union. It's not our priority. It's the same Spanish priority, the same, the same priority uh, Malta, because uh, because of, or let's say, of, of the sanctions against, against Iran, the Malta should transform their import policy, oil policy from other countries, and they sacrificed in this case a lot. That's what I think. The energy security is a common, common, common issue. Uh, the same with the Eastern Partnership. It's a question about our uh, European neighbors. And it's also, it's, it's a matter, I believe, to all countries less or more. That's what uh, I think this is our priority. The same like Vilnius Summit. It, we do not own Vilnius Summit. Vilnius Summit success or not will be the success of EU, of whole EU. That's it. Uh, can I just follow up on the impact on the EU-Russian relationship as we head to, I mean, the energy security issue mm -hmm. is obviously a concern. Uh, Russia has made great concern about uh, the anti-monopoly issues, uh, the third energy package. This could be very confrontational potentially on the EU-Russian agenda. Huh. You know, we, we do have, EU has a post, uh, uh, post negotiation post uh, negotiation agreement. We, we do have a our framework for, ne uh, for negotiations, and EU negotiating with Russia on energy, on, uh, let's say, visa-free regime, and on all matters. We do have uh, the mandate for negotiations, which was given to commission by the member states. And it's a quite a tough mandate, I must say. That's what, uh, of course, the negotiations note goes very well, because I would say in this case, the commission EU Commission stays very strong and firm and trying to implement the mandate of the member states. Uh, the, the second thing, uh, of course, the Russia trying also be present and influential and to remain influential in, in all these uh, Eastern Partnership countries. Just after we left the Kiev, the huge delegation from the Russia Duma came and I would say booked almost whole hotel because we stayed and we discussed with their rather counterparts regarding the customs union. That's what my answer. Sure, yes. Uh, well, as I said in my opening statement, uh, unity is the, uh, that elusive value in Ukraine. Certainly the case continues to be the case to some extent in Belarus. Uh, if I could teach a class on unity and get everybody to do whatever I said, uh, we could win a lot of elections, but that's not going to happen. Uh, we can only help political parties become better organized, provide training, 
provide technical assistance to help them become more competent and run more effective campaigns. The decision to unite or to run separately is not my decision. That's the political party's decision. So what we can do is provide survey data that suggests that unity would be a, a key to victory in a particular election. But we don't dictate that. That's not our decision. That's the political party's decision. What we can do is if they ask our advice and counsel, we can provide it. But again, the decision is theirs. So we'll wait and see. I can only tell you what the data suggests, not what leaders will ultimately decide to do in either Ukraine or in Belarus. A few more questions, and then, Mr. Chairman, you can fire away. Why don't we right, right here? And then we'll get the two in the back. Hello. <clears throat> My name is Archil Gigishid. I'm ambassador of Georgia. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellencies, for interesting remarks. Just uh, to a little bit, uh, uh, you know, to make Georgian voice heard in this uh, call about uh, it. Sorry? Okay, sorry. Uh, well, uh, Georgia is also uh, com committed to deliver for the Vilnius Summit. Uh, we, uh, we will be also initialing the association agreement. We are almost finalized the text, and at the end of my very short brief remarks now, I'll say what is remained, which is very important for Georgia. Um, mm, we do hope that the, uh, mm, uh, that the legal scrubbing will not become an impediment to meeting the mutually uh, agreed political goal within the EU. And we would appreciate if the uh, uh, EU starts internal legal uh, procedures as soon as possible when, when the document is uh, initial. Uh, we are ready to uh, start negotiations on the associ association agenda which will uh, replace uh, the uh, ENP action plan. And we would appreciate if we would get the first draft from the European Union before Vilnius Summit so that we are ready for the B B Vilnius Summit with our own comments and even possibly the uh, draft of the agenda. Um, Georgia is committed to conclude the first legislative phase mm, on the visa liberalization action plan. And uh, with a very high probability, Georgia will do that before Vilnius Summit and we'll be ready uh, for, uh, for going into the uh, second phase. Yeah. Uh, next point is that uh, we hope that, uh, mm, well, the harmonization and approximation introduction of the EU norms and standards uh, is a very uh, costly thing, which also requires, among, uh, apart from financial, also the technical assistance and the uh, know-how and uh, the development and modernization of the existing institutions. So in that regard, we hope that the EU's assistance will be adequate to, uh, to our needs and that the EU, uh, uh, EU will, uh, mm, with, with more uh, competence, uh, well, mm, apply the principle more for more. Uh, one of the EU's uh, mm, strengths in the post-Soviet space vis-a-vis -vis Russia it, it does have very two powerful uh, leverages, which is conditionality and differentiation. But unfortunately, EU uh, was not always effective in using uh, these two leverages. And while Russia, uh, Russia has very powerful soft power in the post-Soviet space, which is open labor market, EU really does need uh, very sophisticated policies in order to challenge uh, uh, Russia in the post-Soviet space. Uh, well, mm, uh, and uh, the last point is that uh, uh, we are talking about uh, how Eastern Partnership countries can deliver uh, by or at uh, the Vilnius Summit. And of course, uh, each of these countries, uh, Moldova was, m was mentioned here, uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, Georgia, Armenia, um, well, uh, these countries are doing their best to, uh, to, be, uh, to be seen and to, to deliver for this summit. Uh, but. Uh, uh, but uh, I think that uh, this principle of for more for more uh, needs to be really applied uh, for uh, to these uh, countries. Uh, and uh, the uh, last point I mentioned, which remains in uh, in uh, finalizing the text of association agreement, is we are debating with the uh, negotiators from the European Commission whether or not to include in the final text uh, of Georgia that Georgia is a European state. So EU bureaucrats uh, are against this. 
And uh, so the, the other, uh, other option was that include, uh, instead of state, include European country. But then this also was dropped. And now we're talking about including Eastern European country. So uh, when, uh, when um, pro-reformists, pro-European forces in these six countries are not uh, encouraged and uh, supported, then it is uh, sometimes very difficult for, uh, for uh, some of the retrograde, I mean, for, uh, difficult for uh, these forces to promote costly, sometimes uh, unpopular uh, decisions in these countries. Uh, so opening up uh, uh, European perspective would be very important because your country when, uh, among others, uh, did succeed in really jumping out from totalitarian system into European democracy in a, uh, in a uh, unprecedented uh, short period of time, was one of the uh, factors was that you did have membership card. We do not have membership card as a prospect. Uh, but nonetheless, nonetheless, we, uh, would, we try to move forward and with, uh, uh, with this, uh, um, uh, with, with this, I mean, sometimes tumbling in this process, but still the trend is positive. We try to move forward. So, uh, the the sooner uh, sooner uh, these um, countries uh, um, obtain European perspective, the better uh, chances that this, uh, these reforms will be faster, more effective, and we will more effectively uh, challenge uh, challenge. Uh, Russian project in the post-Soviet space. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much. I think we have time for those. Boy, we have, wow. Okay, we'll take the two questions back there and then over here, and then we will have our panelists say the final word. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Mike Scallon. I'm with the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, to go to making the Vilnius uh, summit a spectacular summit, uh, to follow up on the words of the German ambassador, I recall when they had this ability uh, association Program Summit in Thessaloniki in 2003 is remembered because it made it clear that the Balkans have a European perspective. So that could be your headline. But in that context, I would also like to have a question about Moldova. I remember Moldova was not seen as a, a possible candidate for uh, asymmetrical trade because of Transnistria, but it got it. Then there was talk about how can you have Moldova move down even in approximation with Europe if you have the uh, Transnistria issue still open, and now we're talking about initializing uh, the AAA, DCFDA. At what point does the Transnistria become truly an anchor on Moldova's ability, if at least the views that you uh, suggest that a European perspective is a given? Thank you. Hi, Asta Benonis with the National Public Affairs Council of the Lithuanian American Community. Um, I was drawn to Mr. Yuatka's comment about the perspective of his colleagues in Brussels and Berlin that he encountered on his most recent trip. You said that if, there were some colleagues that expressed the opinion that if you did not get a association agreement with Ukraine this time at this summit in Vilnius, that one should, the EU should just forget the process, that to, in a essence, to wash their hands of the process. Um, if I understood your comments correctly, what do you think they have in mind then? Um, are they prepared just to allow countries to float off into the Russian sphere of influence under Putin? Uh, or is it just becomes a no man's land on the eastern frontier of Europe? I'm sorry. Well, you seem like you're kind of lost. And you're going around in circles trying to figure out what to do and how to handle it all. And you want somebody from higher up, like in the presidential area? to come down and help you and give you suggestions. Well, John Kerry is our Secretary of State. He works for Obama and he works for everybody in the United States, the Congress and everything. Lithuania, I don't know if they have a Secretary of State in Lithuania. They should find one and go around to these countries, six countries, take notes, have a meeting with each one, get all the effects and everything, gather it all up, and go, and go knock on John Kerry's door. Thank you, thank you, He's a representative Thank you. of the United States. Thank you, that's Ask him yep. 
how do you work your plan here for the United States yeah. will also give you help Thank you, at that level. We'll turn to our panelists now for a quick uh, five minute, last minute uh, thoughts on several of those questions. So maybe very shortly, Please. you mentioned about these pessimists about what uh, I, I was talking about, whom I was talking. Of course, uh, I don't know uh, uh, what they had in mind, this p pessimists who were talking that, you know, if it will be uh, no results, it could be dangerous for this European project. So I don't know what they uh, uh, had in mind, but just I wanted to, to, to tell to you that there are different opinions about the future of this, from my point of view, is a very important project. So just my short, short answer. Very briefly, uh, regarding Moldova, I think the same with Georgia. If a country's lost territories, which were occupied by, by bigger force, it doesn't mean that they uh, have no chance to go towards Europe and to return back to Europe and to become a member. This is a really, from the legal point of view, from a sophisticated legal point of view, of course, you could say, yeah, this is an obstacle. What to do if we are talking about this FTA? Uh, does this FTA will be applied in Transnistria or not? You know, it's, it's a, but this is, I think, it's, it's, a, it's a technicalities. We, we, first of all, we should see uh, the essence of, of the whole process, uh, of the whole process of this country uh, towards, towards Europe. Regarding the Georgia, I just want to very friendly, as a really true friend of Georgia, say, what's going now in Georgia? It's, it's not ac acceptable, at least for my party. I couldn't talk for, for, for my state. By, but the last uh, arrests um, um, doesn't convince me that the Georgia current government acts wisely. And the last answer to, to the lady, to the mem. Uh, regarding, regarding our minister, yes, we do have our uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and, and he visiting and visiting, like I would say, like, like squirrel in the circle, these countries with a huge team, and we are working very hard. Thank you. I'll just, just close by saying that there are a number of important policy discussions that will take place in Vilnius, a number of decisions that will be made, uh, important decisions for the entire region. And regardless of the outcome of what is decided or not decided in Vilnius, I think it will only reflect favorably on the host, Lithuania. Thank you. That's a way, a very positive way to end it. Clearly, I think this conversation needs to continue. So we're at the beginning of the road for our roadmap. Please join me in thanking our distinguished panelists for their remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening.